believe since this year is your book, we will let you lead the conversation, our fearless leader. For the next couple of weeks, yeah, why not? I'm pulling up the, the chapter name so I know kind of what we're going right, because we're one and two. So number one is the new rules. Number two is BMR. All right. So to start out, I know, David, you said that you read the book. Laura, have you read the book before? I have not. So I am like a virgin on all these self-help books right now. Like I cool. have, I've never read really any of them. So it's it's all new material to me. Um, I will say that one thing I am finding that's super common is communication. I think across the board, these self-help books, uh, the common denominator is the ability to effectively communicate. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Absolutely. And so, and this, like we talked about with the last book, this, there's a lot of layers from the seven habits mm -hmm. that kind of peel into, into this book. So, right. So let's get going. So chapter one, <laughs> the reality is I want to spend most of the time today talking about chapter two, because chapter two is really kind of the meat and potatoes starting on it. Chapter one's kind of the intro, but chapter one's cool because it really kind of lays out exactly what this whole book is going to be about. Um, like some of the things talking about how like life, everything in life is a negotiation. You know, er, sometimes people get flustered about being in negotiation. Life is negotiation and we're all irrational creatures. That's one of the things I took away from it. Re-listening to it, talking about how, you know, and we know this, but we almost have to remind ourselves that we're irrational, especially in real estate. We're irrational. Our buyers and sellers are irrational. Let everybody's irrational about the whole thing. Um, there's talked about system one, system two um, thinking. And the big one at the end of the day is hostile negotiators have to win. They can't split the difference, which obviously is the name of the book, but they have to win. So he kind of lays out, you know, kind of his, his game plan for going forward. So with this chapter really being more about kind of an intro, kind of a, a thought provoking chapter, I'm going to start with you, Laura, since it, since this is your first time through the book, what were your thoughts as you were listening to it? Like kind of hearing some of his ideas for the first time. Well, I think, like I said before, there was, you know, there was a lot about communication and effective listening. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that there was a ton of <clears throat> in the intro, just because it felt like it was, it was almost tying the last book we read up in a nice, neat little bow and leading us into how to have effective conversations. So as far as the intro goes in the, the you know, chapter one, the new rules for me, it was just a nice um layout of what to expect or kind of you know what might be coming in the book as far as the next few chapters go so for me it was just kind of a nice recap of you got to communicate you got to effectively listen and um kind of where we're headed from there yeah, Devin, since you've heard, listened to this or are, are you listening to it or are you reading it um so i'm listening to it so you're listening to it too okay so we're all listening right. to it Right. The guy who reads it's fantastic. Yes. I love, yeah. I love his voice. He yes. makes all the points great. <clears throat> um, but maybe you're like me, like when I listen to it, every time I listen to that first chapter, after I've heard the book before, it just reilluminates something. It really it, it catches something. Was there something else that you heard this time? Um so yeah, two things specifically. Um one, it, it wasn't more of you know I guess maybe I heard it a different way it was um so kind of what you were talking about you know as far as you know speaking with negotiating on rational it's like generally we're irrational and and in the examples that he goes through there is no rationality you know and there is no give and take it's you know no um you know we can't talk about the hostages. We need all of those and we need you, you know, so they need their cake and they need to eat it too. Right. And so it's kind of negotiating from that standpoint, whereas, you know, where he goes to talk with the folks at Harvard, it's mostly based on like rationality and it's 
uh, based on like, um, you know, kind of formulas and like, you know, theories. And so, you know, when they come face to face, you see how like, almost like they're just talking through a brick wall, whereas they're supposed to be the experts in it. You know, I it, there's just, you know, those different kinds of the ways of looking at the negotiation. I feel like every time I read that, that first chapter, it is just, um, I don't know, it still baffles me every time. Um, and then also the differences between hypotheses and assumptions. Um, he he kind of talks about that. I don't remember if that's chapter one or chapter two, um, but I know the second time hearing it, I, I actually didn't pick up on it on the first time. Um, and in my field, assumptions we get to all the time, but they're blinding. And he talks about why they're blinding. Right. And just that the past couple of days doing some audits, I'm like, oh, this is actually a little easier. It's like I, I've been blinded by the assumptions, their hypotheses. Right. Until I prove. Right. You know? So but but yeah, I mean just just those two things, just kind of rereading, you know, those that first chapter or maybe some of the second chapter. I, I mean it's I, I'm just seeing new things and I knew I would. So I was kind of excited about reading this book. Right. Yeah, because this is my third time through it. And like you said, mm -hmm. um it's the assumptions thing. And that might be more chapter two, but okay. to your credit, that's something that we all need to remember is like, mm -hmm. especially us in real estate, we call somebody about, do you want to sell your home? Yeah. They want to sell their home. We want to move to Florida. We got to go deeper. You know, mm -hmm. why do they want to move to Florida? And then what's the real reason behind that? And what's the real reason behind that? We hear right. something, we just keep going to the next thing. Whereas right. if we get more emotional about it and get them to be emotional, and the other thing was when he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Harvard people mm -hmm. doing the thing, again, this is the rational versus irrational thing of negotiating in that the Harvard people are the buttoned up. We've been to school for 500 years. We know our crap. And he went in and kicked their butt and all he did was just ask questions. Mm -hmm. he, li he listened. He, he, he listened. Right. Right. Exactly. Just, well, and I think that when we when we have hypothesis and we we have conclusions and stuff like that, we we tend to not listen, right? That like we tend to shut everything else off. And so that was something else that I really picked up on in these chapters was his, you know, stop for four seconds, make a statement as a question, and stop for four seconds and give yourself that time. Because Steve, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm in the middle of talking to somebody who I know is wrong, because their house is priced ten thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, overpriced and we want to come in $15,000 below and I can adjust, you know, I can uh, um, make a reasonable argument for that. We're always quick to just jump. Right. So, you know, I think that if we listen, I think it's easier to remove those hypotheses, re remove those conclusions because we're not under a preconceived notion. We're actually listening and, and taking in what they're telling us. Right. Right. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So, because chapter one was so kind of just overview of what's getting ready to happen, there's not really any central theme. So I didn't want to spend too much time on that, but I think we covered everything we needed to cover in chapter one. Chapter two, love chapter two. What's the name of it again? Be a mirror. Be a mirror. If this, if the book was only this chapter and the only thing you learned out of this chapter were the, the three things we're going to talk about. Like we'd be light years ahead of any other negotiator or any other realtor or whatever that's going right now because nobody's doing this stuff. And this is the building block of everything else, but nobody's doing these things. So just as a recap, the, there's a hostage situation in New York City at a bank and it went through some of the things that they had to go through with the NYPD. But there's three themes that I pulled out that we need to remember as we go forward. Number one, I guess we'll just, we'll say it first. The name of the chapter is Be a Mirror. Mm -hmm. We have to be a mirror. We have to. Be, so I'll let you, Laura, you Devin, talk about kind of what that means and, and how we can use that in our day to day. Well, I, I think when you're a mirror, you know, when you, when, when you sit down and, and they're teaching us how to do listing presentations or buyer presentations, they tell you if the person leans in, you lean in person sits back you sit back repeat what you hear because when you create a situation where you're listening and you're you're becoming a mirror that inevitably creates trust in that person and they don't even realize it creates trust and so when you become that mirror 
you know, when you become exactly what they are. And I find myself doing this across the board and it's almost comical with clients. Like there's certain people, you know, you, you're you quiet and you're reserved. And, you know, I coached an agent on this yesterday. Understand the disc profile, because if you understand a disc profile, then you understand the person you're working with and it's easier to mirror and to, to, to conversate to that personality. But when right. you become that mirror, you know, there's, I have one client who she's a little vulgar and she's, 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 you know, kind of her own person. I love her to death. But I find myself when I'm talking to her, oh, fuck that, 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 right? And then, you know, my next client who's like this awesome little perfectly dressed, amazing mom of three boys, she stays at home, her husband's a doctor and she, you know, and I find myself almost being, I don't want to use the word chameleon, but I find that, you know, when you, when you chameleon yourself or you marry yourself to your environment, that environment will trust you and in negotiations, trust is key. Trust is number one. I mean, you know, when they talk about the hostage, hold on one second. Yes. Oh, when they talk about the hostage that didn't want to be at the bank, sorry, typical. <laughs> He's got to walk by and say hello. It's, 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 like, it's like Grand Central Station. I understand. <laughs> Every Tuesday. Um, but anyway, you know, when they talk about that second hostage, not even wanting to be in, in the midst of this, I think he was having one kind of conversation with not hostage. I'm sorry, robber. Um, yeah. He was having one kind of conversation with the head robber, but when he got more details, he was able to have a different kind of conversation with the second person and got him out immediately. And they right. had, you know, he was the second negotiator on the phone and had the first negotiator mirrored those things and flustered that first bad guy you know screw this i'm getting off the phone you're outsmarting me they may have gotten people out quicker and this you know the situation would have been de-escalated much sooner so i think mirroring people probably should be within second nature if you're in sales period right or you want to have a good relationship with another human exactly yeah so i i obviously i agree with everything Lori. you just said um, a couple of things I would add. So for this, the be a mirror. Um, good grief! Y'all. Should know I'm busy. Uh, so with being the mirror, to me, this actually almost is like his first way of saying slow it down. Because like if you if you kind of in the book, he kind of talks about putting it into practice. Um, and how the first time you put it into practice is really awkward. It's terribly awkward. It's horrible. It's weird. <laughs> right. You know, and so the first time I read this, I actually turned around and implemented it in my audit practice. And it, when you slow it down and you and you do the mirror kind of like he's talking, um it's it's crazy. It's like it's like word vomit. It's like, and, it, and it's it's interesting. And sometimes it's because I think the other person feels awkward and they should have explained more. All you have to hit them with, so you said, you know, or or just that mirror, you just repeat the last couple of words and they'll, and they'll keep going and they'll keep going and they'll keep going. And as, as long as you just kind of, you know, practice that mirror while they're talking, you know, in between the, um, you know, the awkward pauses, you get so much information and, and it's like, that in the hostage situation, the way they kind of slowed it down, you know, and took the time to really just understand what it is they're hearing, completely turned the situation around. Completely. Because at that point they understood, but they had to take the time and they had to show that mirror. That they, they had to practice the mirror, like like effortly practice it, not just, you know, you know, just kind of yeah, you kind of playing along with it, kind of like with intention. It's like I think a lot of us will will do it um, unintentionally, and I think a lot of people will do it intentionally. And Lord, to your point, I think that's that sales aspect when you use it intentionally and you know what you're using it for. I, I mean, it puts you in a whole it, it put completely different pool of fish. We're swimming the charts, right? You know. Well, we're always taught that we're we're supposed to you know listen twice as much as we talk. Mm-hmm. You know, the seventy thirty rule. And, and two ears, one mouth. Two ears, one mouth. That's how God made us for a reason. So, exactly. Um, 
and it's easier said than done, especially since, I mean, my first 10 years were in New Jersey. So I had, I have New Jersey roots in me. So I talk really fast. So it, so we have to always slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, because, you know, I think, especially when I'm on the phone as a salesperson, people already, we are driving people crazy. Right. Well, and you, and you want to get your point across, right? right? And you understand, like, if you understand the language of sales, you have the first five seconds. Then after that, they're checking Facebook if you're on the phone with them or reading an email or whatever. And I think we all tend to talk quickly, but I think that slowing it down, mirroring them and then listening, right? That's the key. That's where it comes in. Because if you're quiet, people will start talking. Like they don't know what to do with silence. Right. Exactly. And the mirror and the mirror just instead of them being on Facebook or whatever, if you mirror them, it gets them talking more. And, mm-hmm. and then you just never know what you're going to get out of them mm-hmm. if they're talking, you know, exactly. and just keep them going. So, so yeah, that's the thing about the mirror is like just mirroring their last two or three words. Obviously, mm-hmm. it's all the other stuff too. But and the specific thing that he talked about was that, and it helped him to slow everything down, get the one hostage out, like you were saying. The other thing, and it kind of goes along with it, and David, you just talked about it slow it down okay so that's the second thing we got to take out of this is just slowing it down laura i mean outside of what we've already talked about because i think we talked about this a little bit so you're, you're crossing the streams you're screwing up my flow here um <laughs> it's all <laughs> <off floor. laughs> i mean is it harder for us in person or on the phone or I mean, is there a situation that's easier than others to to not? I kind of feel like if we're on the phone, like you said, we got to jump quick. Mm-hmm. We got to get their we got to get their attention, but at the same time, we can't be a butt about it. Right. Whereas we we can probably do a little bit better in person. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I think in person is so much easier because you can read their body language in person. You're not just mirroring or repeating the last three words. You may shift weights just like they do. You may cross your arms if they cross their arms. You may unfold your arms. You know, you may lean in. So it's not just a vocal mirror. It's a visual mirror. And I think when you've got somebody and you're using multiple senses, right? The more senses you use, the more um, the more in that moment you currently are. And so for me, being on the phone, you know, it's it's hard. Now, something he did talk about was when you are on the phone, smile. Right. Like, I think our conversations when we're all like talking like we are right now, they're not nearly as engaging or fun as when we're all even if we're not laughing or joking, but when we're smiling. And I do believe that if you slow it down, if you smile, if you ask those questions and if you pause, you're going to get to the answer you need. It may not be the answer you like, but you'll get to the answer you need. And then at that point, that trust is built. And having those conversations are easier. So for me, it's way easier to be in person because you have multiple senses that you're able to to use. You know, if they, then you. That's my perspective. There's your perspective. All right. Yeah, I would. So I would agree um, from the standpoint of it, it's, significantly easier in um in person um and and to me i've always kind of read that as like the instant feedback um because you know to your to your point laura it's it's you know there's there's the mirror of you know kind of mirroring their speech um you know then there's also the mirror of you know kind of um you know mirroring their actions and it's like for me <clears throat> the actions also provide like that feedback of you know how's the conversation going and where should I go you know and, and then from there I don't know I, I've been acting so I'm always like paying attention to people's quirks and so I like label them as like okay they're they're it's a positive interaction Versus like, oh, you know, I need to back away. Like, he, so, it, and I'll kind of look for those positive um, things and that's what I'll mirror. But for me, it's just like, it, it's, can't do that unless I'm in person, you know? But whenever I'm on the phone, I try and find 
any kind of way it, it, or um, not even just the phone you know nowadays we have like the um um the video calls and that's that's what i'll try and push for even if uh, i think sometimes i've been on calls where i'm on camera and no one else is but even those are easy and it's because, and, and I guess now that I think about it, it, it I'm usually smiling. I'm usually smiling and I'm either standing up or I'm sitting down and I'm fully attent because I know people are looking at me. And so it, it changes, it, it changes the way you kind of talk too. But I feel like any, the more senses you can get involved, generally it's the easy, easier it's for me. <clears throat> very cool. Very cool. Now that, so Keeping in mind that the, the two big themes to me to remember are to slow it down and to be a mirror. So there's one thing that we can take away from it, like a tactical thing that that stood out from this that that we always talk about. And when we said to Stacy on Facebook, that is this is what he mentioned on Facebook. It's the one thing that he remembers: the late night FM DJ voice. <laughs> Because if you do the late night FM DJ voice, you you have to slow it down. You have to be in control, and it and it opens yourself up to be a mirror, you know. So, just keeping that in mind. I mean, do you have? Is there something that you do, Laura, when you're talking to people? Is there like a like a pneumatic device, or is there something on your screen that just to remind you, like to do that that piece? It, is there a physical action? No, but I almost caught the giggles because I don't think women have a late night DJ voice. Okay. Right. I think that's a man thing. Okay. <laughs> First of all, enough. I don't have a <laughs> very sexy, like I just I just don't have a deep well, sexy it doesn't, voice. No, it doesn't have to be sexy. I mean, that's <laughs> you didn't say that. Listen, <laughs> listen. I, I, a late night DJ voice expects you to be in bed and he's talking to you that way, okay? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but to his point, and I'll answer your question in a second, the first negotiator was negotiating from a stance of, if I remember correctly, of authoritarian voice. Right. Right. And that doesn't ever get you anywhere. Whether you're parenting your children, trying to get a client, talking to somebody because you're negotiating a contract, or to your point, David, talking to a new client talking to an old client and trying to get them, you know, we were on the, we were in the car the other day and he was talking to a client and they were trying to get an answer. And of course the client only had half the answer because there's multiple people in this chain of command. And um, the guy was trying to be helpful, but David was patient and he would wait for the guy to do, you know, to, to look up what he needed to look up. And he didn't try to answer the questions or put words in this guy's mouth. He actually did a very good job putting this in place but I don't know that there's anything that I do to be cognizant of that. Probably because I've had a job where I've had to talk to people my entire life. I've been in sales. So I have what my kids call the work voice. Right? I get the work voice. The work voice. And they're like, mom, why are you turning on your work voice? That's not how you sound at all, ever. And <laughs> I had no idea, of course, and my kids have been saying this for years, and so while I don't believe women have a late night DJ voice, um, I do believe we have the second voice that he says, which is that he has, right? And I think from a woman's perspective, that's probably more what you get from me on the other end of the phone or that conversation is, you know, I'm here, I'm happy to be in this moment. I'm happy to be listening. And that's, and I'm happy to find a solution, right? I'm a yes person. You have a question, my answer is yes. We'll find a solution for that. I don't know what it is. Sometimes we'll find it. Right. And so I just think for me, I just happened to luck out that I had a good example because my mother also had the work voice <laughs> and I spent years listening to it. So I think that was a naturally learned behavior. This book brought it to the forefront of my brain and made me cognizant of why that was effective or why maybe I was doing it. Um, so I, I, I can't, I can't pinpoint one natural thing, but I'm sure there was something in my 42 years of life that, that said, Hey, talk like this. And, and it's true. I, I, I got a work voice. I got a, you know, I, I find myself sitting up straighter. I find my, 
you know, I put that smile on and I'm all right, how can I help? Let's just do it. <laughs> right. You know, which is not slow, but, and that's probably my biggest, I can listen, I can stop. I do not slow down. My word quota is 15,000 a day. And some days I need to double it. <laughs> there you go. Devin. Um, so I, I guess for me, my reminder is usually, um, so to Laura's point, I'm usually, a lot of my phone calls are kind of like trying to understand something. Usually I'm, I'm brought in for some kind of problem to help the problem fix. I always remind myself every time, don't answer the question. Don't answer the question because I have to do so much research up front. And by the time I've got to the conversation, I could probably talk circles around some of the people in the call or I at least feel that way. Right. And so when I get on the call, I just have to remind myself every time. I've had enough people kind of tell me that as well, um, just like CPAs uh, and other mentors. Um, and they'll usually just tell me, you know, hey, look, dude, <clears throat> fantastic on the call. Let the people talk, though. Because I have been, I have been kind of um, guilty of that because right. I'll answer the questions and I'll know the answers. But at the same time, a lot of the times that goes back to those assumptions. And I get blinded and I feel like I know the answer. So what am I listening for? Right. And so by the time I've reminded myself of that, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm supposed to be listening on this call. <clears throat> you know, and, and so a lot of the times that in itself is my reminder. And I've been reminding myself so many times. Um, it, it, it's almost second nature. Sometimes I'll do it and not pay attention. I, I won't notice it. I'll be like, I, I should be saying something. They're looking for me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and he yeah. said something. He said something in the chapter about how, like, like people who are like super intelligent, like they suck at asking questions because, like, they know the answer and exactly. they don't. Though then they don't really listen to what everybody else has to say. They, they already have their assumptions. They already have it figured out. Whereas, if you go into it and just, you know, you you have to ask questions. And what was it? You just said something. That reminded me of, you know, you go into it and, oh, you know the answers to the questions. Like, and it's like, we ask questions to gain deeper knowledge from them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it just, <clears throat> when we know the answer and we're already thinking about what we're going to say, we're not listening to anything about what they're going to say. And they keep going. And then we shoot something back that had nothing to do with what they had to say. And then more than likely they're exactly. doing the same thing. And we're just like talking over each other. Exactly. You know? So oh, and when you ask questions and listen, sometimes you can get the person to what you want them. You you can ask guiding questions like a seller. Explain to me, Mr. Saw. I understand. I get it. You want one hundred and forty thousand dollars for your ninety thousand dollar you know house. Can you explain to me why that's what your desired price is? Yeah, if I recall, Steve, I think I think there's some more um, insight on what Laura's talking about in the book in a later yeah. chapter. Yeah. Well, for, yeah, we're, we're getting there, right? <laughs> the, the last the last thing I want to talk about because I think this this is important and something else that that y'all said reminded me of this: the importance of active listening. Is that listening is one of the most active things that we can do if we're doing it right. And he made a mention of sometimes they have five or six people listening to the phone calls to be sure they hear everything, which sounds goofy. It's only one person talking, but five or six people listen to it. They hear five or six different ways that that conversation went. So all of this stuff like leads towards active listening, the importance of that. And as, as, a, as a man, I will admit that maybe I don't actively listen as well as my wife does. I will admit that. I'll throw it out there. <laughs> do you feel, but do you feel like it's that way at your house too? I mean, do you feel like women have naturally a better, no? Nope. Nope. Because at my house, I am constantly involved in 19,000 other things with six kids, four dogs, three lizards, one tortoise, a real estate career. I'm flipping houses. We just rolled out a new division in the company Monday. Like, Not the lizards, too. Sleeping <laughs> lizards, man. You know, right? And so at my house, it's very opposite. And I have to actually 
you know, I, I have found, um, because I teach communication skills and I, they were not always there, right? And I found that when I learned those effective listening skills and effective communication skills, it created a relationship with my children that was already strong, but it just took it to a different level. And so for me, when somebody comes up to me in a random moment in time that needs that attention, you know, in, 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 you know, I think every situation is a negotiation. You may agree. So it's an easy negotiation, but like when my kids are, Hey mom, I need this, or I want that, or let's have a conversation. It's actually, we created a system in my home where as soon as they came home from school, if they needed me immediately, they would come let me know that. And then I would give them the time frame that I needed to complete the task that was at hand so that when I did stop that task and get up from my desk and go have those conversations with them, they had my full attention because if they didn't allow me to finish whatever, well, while we were having that conversation, I was sorting that problem out in my head. So in my house, my husband is better than than me at listening. I don't think it's a male female thing. I think it's a personality thing. Okay. I think it's a it's more of that my high I high D doesn't really give me the ability to listen because as soon as you've opened your mouth, if I think it's a good idea, I've already jumped. And as soon as you open your eye, if it's a bad idea, I've already run away in the next direction. So I right. have to actually stop myself. You know, and David probably catches the most of that, the brunt of that. <laughs> Flipping these damn houses with me. Laura, did you listen to anything I just said? <laughs> darn thing here. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so at my house, it's different. But I, I, to me, it's a personality thing. My my Craig is more, um, more laid back and just um, not all over the place. And. And it's important to him, right? I think that's another thing that's that's important to touch on. Listening is not important to everybody. It's got to be something that's important to you or you're not going to do it no matter how hard your brain is going to wander. Right. And, and, and the, the D's and I's, like you said, I mean, especially the D's. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have time to listen. We have to go run through walls. You know? Yes. I'm creating a mess so I can clean it up later. Right. It's, it's Let me go create my mess, damn it. That's <laughs> funny. I would I would say for me, um I kind of go in and out uh, on both. And and a lot of the times, um, to Laura's point, I guess it kind of depends on the personality that I'm with. Um the majority of my family are talkers. They will talk you down, but they will also listen. It's very strange. I I, I don't know. Um, but I've kind of picked up that same thing. I've always just listened to my family. They always have good stuff to say, so I just listen to it. Um, and so in my relationship with my fiance, she's not a talker. I'm the talker. Right. So usually she's actively listening. But then I don't, I guess, I usually listen too, but at that point she, she doesn't talk as often as I am. Usually it's just me talking. But at that point, I'm just filling space. So she's probably using a lot of these tactics on me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she's so, seeing exactly what she can get out of you because exactly, you talk all yeah. day long, but you don't give her details on anything. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> so, but that that's that's my that's been my experience. Very cool. Very cool. So. We'll leave it at that because, like I said, that I mean, if it was just this one chapter, if we focused on slowing it down, mm -hmm. the late night DJ voice, or or however women do <laughs> late night DJ voice, you're talking woman to me late night. Hello, boys. Hello, boys. See, I mean, that would, now you have my that was late night DJ voice. I would listen to that. <laughs> I listen to that. Hold on, voice. Things things just got interesting. All right, um, <laughs> but if we but if we use the DJ voice, be the mirror, slow it down, that's just going to put us light years ahead. That's without using anything else in this book. So like he said in chapter one, they're building blocks. And, you gotta, mm -hmm. and as blah, blah, blah. so this is the big building block. Then the beer mirror, mirror thing is, is so cool. And it really does work because I've used it. Right. I've used it on my family the, after the first couple of times I, I've read this and I need to get back to it just because I need them to. I need them to, to talk more about what's really going on because you always get the drive-by. Right, but, exactly. Um, 
Well, and I think you just made a good point, Steve. I think we mm -hmm. read these books and I think we get very excited about them. And then we move on to the next thing, the next book, the next whatever. And we forget mm -hmm. to utilize these things. So I'd like to challenge y'all because I really do like this book. Um, I would say that as we're reading these chapters, let's find atomic habits that we can input into our lives. And for me, that habit's going to be the four second rule. Right. I'm I sorry. That, did you say the four second rule? I did. <laughs> <laughs> that was my mirror. <laughs> so don't feel their pain, label it. And beware, yes, master, no. That's that one. That's a big one for me. I need to work on. I'm looking forward to. I've listened to him a couple times already. I'm going to listen to him a couple more times between now and next week. But chapter three and four. Looking forward to the difference. This is Steve. Oh, thanks, Steve. You did good. great. <laughs> good, good talking to you today. Right. <laughs> we'll catch you later. Come on, Laura. Give us one more, Laura, before we go off. Come on. Good night, boys. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Uh, Thank you.